a transcript. You can toggle on that uh, to, to see the subtitles if you choose to. Uh, we are going to be uh, videotaping this or recording this session this evening. So um, you as an attendee will not appear in the video, but if you have a problem with um, that, you can opt to, to step out. And uh, I need to make sure all our panelists are fine being recorded. Um, many of them have done this in the past, and so we are uh, recording this. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the PHMC Virtual Collection Showcase for the month of July 2021. Our shared theme today is travel and destinations. My name is David Miller, and I'm the museum educator at Old Economy Village, located in Ambridge, Pennsylvania. We're 18 miles north of Pittsburgh along the Ohio River. Old Economy Village is hosting this event this evening because our curator, Sarah Buffington's presentation, uh, received the most votes for the virtual collection showcase back in February. So uh, tonight you'll get a chance to, to vote on uh, what site you think um, covers the topic the best, and that winner will be able to host uh, one of these showcases in the future. We have five panelists this evening from the Pennsylvania Trail of History. Each panelist is, will receive five minutes to present on the topic of travel and destinations. If you have any questions during the program, please use the Q&A feature or type them in the chat box. At the end of the program, you'll get a chance to vote for who you think best covered the topic. We are going to have our presenters go in alphabetical order by site name. Uh, so I'm going to have each presenter introduce themselves and their site, starting with Sean. So at this point, you'll just be giving your name and where you work, and then you'll be giving your presentation shortly. All right. Hello, good evening, everybody. My name is Sean McIntyre. I'm the museum facilitator at Bushy Run Battlefield Museum, which is in Jeanette, Pennsylvania, which is probably about 25 miles to the east of Pittsburgh, PA. Um, and I'll be presenting on the pack saddles at uh, Bushy Run Battlefield. All right, and Jen Royer, you're up next. Hello, I'm Jennifer Royer from Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum. I'm the museum curator, and we're in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Buffington. I'm the curator at Old Economy Village in Ambridge, Pennsylvania. Our other Jen? Hi, I'm Jennifer Gleim. I'm the curator at the Pennsylvania Military Museum in Polesburg, Pennsylvania, just outside State College. And Dodie. Hi, I'm Dodie Robbins. I'm a collections manager at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in Strasburg in Lancaster County. All right, thank you, panelists. Again, each site will have five minutes to present. Uh, our first panelist is going to be Sean McIntyre from Bushy Run Battlefield. Go ahead, right. Sean. Pull up my thing real quick and get started. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about what, what is important about the pack saddles at Bushy Run Battlefield and uh, why are they they're part of Duque's expedition? So why the pack saddle? Um, I'm going to go through the program here a little bit to kind of discuss why I chose the pack saddle as part of this exhibit uh, on transportation and movement. So I'm going to uh, go a little bit further into this. So we're going to talk about the siege of Fort Pitt real quick. Um, so June 27, June 22nd, 1763, a pan uh, native forces attacked uh, Fort Pitt. Uh, what is, which is now Pittsburgh. Um, the siege had continued for uh, several months. It actually continued into August of uh, 1763. Um, the siege continues as well as uh, uh, attacks on some of the other settlements uh, on the frontier, which inc included uh, the Shawnee and Lene Lene forces attacking them. Um, in July, Bouquet organizes a relief effort to get to Fort Pitt as well as uh, resupply the other forts along the way. So Bouquet leaves, uh, Bouquet leaves Carlisle, PA with uh, the 42nd uh, uh, Regiment of Foot, which is the Black Watch, which I am actually a direct descendant of a member of the Black Watch, um, the 60th Regiment of Foot, which is the Royal Americans, and the 77th Re Regiment of Foot. Uh, he supplies all the forts along the ways with uh, cannons 
as well as uh, other food supplies and other necessary supplies, and arrives at Fort Ligonier on July 2nd, 1763. Uh, sorry, August 2nd, 1763. I don't know why I put July there. <laughs> um, so at Fort Ligonier, he changes how he supplies, is gonna supply the units. They, uh, all the equipment he was carrying was on horse carts, and he decides that they're, they're gonna offload everything onto the horses themselves because the terrain is a lot harder to get through and it's a lot easier to move all these uh, horses through there instead of entire horse carts. So loads the pack horses and mules. Uh, so the pack saddle that you uh, saw at the beginning was actually one of the pack saddles used during that time period. So it is essentially just a wood frame that's placed on the back of the horse and the supplies are put over it. Some of the horses were carrying as much as 300 pounds of supplies when they were transporting to Fort Pitt. Um, they were also transporting a bunch of cattle, sheep, and pigs to resupply Fort Pitt because a lot of their food stock had been destroyed. And there were also 400 men, including soldiers and pack horses, pack horse drivers on this trip. And this is a rather famous photo uh, painting by Robert Griffin. Uh, now that shows in our museum as well. Um, and one mile from Bushy Run Station, which was a wood frame building, which is along the Bushy Run Creek, um, they were attacked uh, by several native forces. Uh, a whole host of uh, different nations were represented. Um, the battle continues until nightfall. Many of the supply horses were killed. Flower bags were removed from those horses to actually make a breastworks fort to protect the injured and uh, the other men that were there. And the battle begins again the next morning and will continue until about 10.30 a.m. Uh, when, uh, due to a flanking maneuver by the Highlanders, the uh, native forces are pushed back up over the hill and the battle essentially ends by about 11.30 that day. So the pack saddle itself, this is basically what it looks like. Um, this is one of the ones that survived the battle itself. Um, and it is part of our museum. and is one of the only artifacts we have from the actual battle at the museum. Um, and if it wasn't for these pack saddles, basically Pittsburgh wouldn't have been resupplied. Fort Pitt wouldn't have uh, probably been able to hold out the siege much longer. They were out of food, they were losing ammunition quickly, and they really had no other means to get anything other than these pack horses coming up over the hills from Fort Ligonier. And that's about it for me. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sean. I'm going to ask each presenter to paste your site donation link in the chat after you give your presentation. So the people viewing tonight, feel free to uh, donate to one or all of the sites that are presenting. Okay, next up we have uh, Jen Royer. There was a common belief that Pennsylvania Germans did not leave their farms, homesteads, or families for leisurely travel or vacation. They were too preoccupied caring for their livestock, such as the pigs seen on the right, or harvesting their crops, such as the tobacco seen on the left. Both photographs were taken by Henry Landis, one of the founders of Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum. The photograph on the right showed, shows Henry's grandfather overseeing his animals standing in front of his barn. Grandfather Landis was known as a hardworking, no-nonsense farmer who fell into the stereotype of never leaving his farms and always putting them first. Grandfather Landis owned and worked two substantial farms nine miles apart. And though he had two hired hands and seasonal laborers, he often demanded that his son, Henry and George Landis's father, perform all the evening work. Henry H. Landis, the brother's father, wrote in his diary, that I was given little time to play and only when I gave my parents the slip. It is therefore not surprising that he became overindulgent with his own sons, Henry and George, and sent them to boarding school, college, and let them have hobbies and collect multiple objects growing up. Seeing his son's disregard for farming, Grandfather Landis bequeathed one of his farms to his grandchildren, Henry and George Landis, and not to his own son going against Pennsylvania German tradition. Grandfather Landis was hoping that his grandchildren would one day go into farming and treat his farm as their number one priority as he did. Unfortunately for him, 
That was not going to happen, fortunately for us. As a result, we have Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum. However, Grandfather Landis should have seen it coming. In 1885, 20-year-old Henry Landis wrote a newspaper essay contest with won a newspaper essay contest with the submission, Farmer's Boys, The Importance of Early Training. This is just an excerpt of his essay. In it, Henry Landis wrote that farm boys' minds and sense of self-worth would benefit from exposure to cultural leisure and travel rather than simply bringing them up as farmhands. While urban dwellers and sons of the wealthy, whether urban or rural, had access to culture, our honest farm boy seldom or never sees the grand hall, museum, or immense libraries. Possibly hoping some farmers would take Henry Landis's advice, this broadside shows just how mobile Pennsylvania Ger German farmers could be if they wanted to get out of town for a four day excursion. The three foot by two foot paper advertisement reads, Farmers and Mechanics second annual excursion to Cape May via Steamer Republic or to Atlantic City via Camden and Atlantic Railroads the old reliable broad gauge route, Saturday, July 16th. Round trip tickets good for four days. The schedule from various stops in Lancaster County is listed. The cost is $2.75, no matter what stop you prefer. The broad side also offered the opportunity to Raymond, remain in Philadelphia to go to the zoological gardens and sleep at the Central Avenue Hotel if you show your PNRR special excursion tickets. This photograph shows beachgoers awaiting the arrival of the luxury steamer Republic at Cape May in 1895. The Reading and Columbia Railroad was part of the Reading Company system and had connections with the steamer Republic in Philadelphia. As the broadside stated, the Republic would take travel travelers to Cape May by boat if they wished. The Republic operated from 1878 to 1903 and provided round trip transportation between Philadelphia and Cape May for $1. The broadside in the Landis Valley collection is advertising the second annual farmers and mechanics excursion. The first annual excursion was held in 1880. It was advertised in the Lancaster Daily Intelligencer newspaper. The details are the, are the same travel to Cape May or Atlantic City or remain in Philadelphia for $2.75. As the ad says, you pay your money and you take your choice. This ad was printed in 1880. It is believed that the broadside in the collection advertising the second annual excursion is from 1887 or 1892, since July 16th fell on a Saturday in both of those years. This broadside was missing about half an inch of the far left edge with some of the station information missing. In 2018, it was determined that it will be sent out for conservation to add the missing paper and printing. It took a bit of research to find the names of some of the stations along the line. A few of the stations do not exist anymore. The Im image on the left is before conservation with the missing paper, creases, and wrinkles. The image on the right shows the broadside after conservation with the added information and stations. Through research, we have not determined if there was ever a farmers and mechanics third annual excursion. However, we do know this broadside is a unique piece of Pennsylvania German travel history. No other copies have been found at the Lancaster County Historical Society, the Pennsylvania State Archives, or the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jen. Up next, we have Sarah Buffington. Thanks, David. Let me pull up my presentation. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about John 
S. Duss um, and his highly controversial musical tour. Um, John Duss is a, a, a big character at Old Economy Village, and um, he had quite a musical career that took him on the road. So that's that's the story I'm going to tell you about, if I can make it work. Okay, um, so here's John Duss in the center of this picture with the band. And in the back, you can see the George Rapp House, which you can see on tour at Old Economy Village. And he is part of the Economy Band. He's holding his cornet and um, he became the conductor of the band. So he, he was not a harmonist um, right away. He was the child of um, someone that came to the Harmony Society um, as a boy for, with a hired worker mother. Um, and his father was someone that um, went away to fight in the Civil War and um, died of wounds during the Battle of Gettysburg. So he was an orphan um, by 19th century standards and he came to live at Economy. So he went to school to learn music in Ohio and uh, decided to go out and ranching, do ranching out in Kansas and Nebraska. But he was called back to Economy in 1888 to teach school. And so he came back and then by 1890, he had become a member of the Harmony Society as it was dwindling. It didn't have very many people um, in, the, um, in the society anymore um, because the Harmony Society was celibate. So he decided to become a member. And then within two years, well, actually that summer, he became a trustee of the Harmony Society. So really quickly, he went from membership to trusteeship. And then by 1892, he was head trustee of the society. So the following year in 1893, he started his, as he called it, short but brilliant career. That was his musical career. So he decided to take over the economy, uh, economy band that you see right here. He eventually took it on the road, um, marching through streets all over the country. He did GAR, um, um, reunions. GAR is the Grand Army of the Republic, um, the um, veterans um, get-togethers from the Civil War time. So he did that in all through the 1890s, making his band bigger and better. So he developed this band from um, people that, that were members of the Harmony Society at Economy, and he also went out and got um, people from all over the place. So here he is marching through the streets of an unknown town. And then at GAR um, get-togethers like this, GAR reunions. So he just kept growing this, um, this band. And then he started publishing music. And so this is um, different pieces of his music that he uh, wrote and had published through the years. And then that, that leads us up to um, 1902, when he decided that he was going to rent out the, um, the Metropolitan Opera House Orchestra in New York, New York City. And so he, he did this probably with money from the Harmony Society because they had a lot of money at the time. I like to show the trolley. This is, um, this is the music that they're playing at the, um, the Heinz History Center in Pittsburgh on their trolley. But so, so John Duss became the, the conductor of this big band and then an orchestra. And he had so many different movements while he was up on stage that they started making fun of him in the newspapers. And um, these are some of his, his characteristics that he was, he was doing. And, you know, I really think that he was kind of like a conductor of um, like modern orchestras sometimes. They, they tend to be a little more outlandish, but I think in the 1890s into the early 1900s, you didn't do that stuff. So he was kind of ahead of his time. So um, he played 
all of the summer of 1902 in um, in New York City. And then he decided to rent out Madison Square Gardens. So this is what it looked like back in 1903 um, on the right. And then on the left, you can see Venice. He decided that he wanted to make a huge uh, production in Madison Square Garden. He had water introduced to the building, never had been there before. And he had grandstands full of people. So um, you could see the water and the gondolas and the bridges. And he just made such a huge show. And this was in the paper all the time. And, um, and he, he got um, Lillian Nordica as an opera singer to perform with him all the time and Edward Doreska, who was a noted basso. So, um, but when it came to an end, um, his music career was basically ended as he would say, um, because he had a, um, he was struck by a falling water tank which crippled his right arm and ended his musical career. Although he did keep on going and um, per, uh, performing at Old Economy Village. But I wanted to tell you one way that they, um, they advertised him in the newspapers was peerless, preeminently popular, pronounced peculiar, peculiarly progressive, predominantly powerful and practically perfect band. It's just so funny. So anyways, that's the story of John Duss hitting the road, and I hope you enjoyed it. All right, thank you, Sarah. Oh, of course, I have to show you how, how into himself he was. There's so many pictures in the collection of John Duss. So, there you go. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, up next we have uh, Jenny Wine from the Pennsylvania Military Museum. Okay, can everybody see my screen now? I'm going to tell you about a gentleman whose photographs just came into the Military Museum's collection uh, last month. Harold Beard, handsome young man you see here in the photograph, was born in 1903 and raised in Hanover, York County. He joined the Army on June 13th, 1919 about 11 days before his 17th birthday. Um, very soon after he joined, he was sent to training at Fort Mason, California. Fort Mason was the logistical and transportation hub for American military operations in the Pacific. And soon after he was at Fort Mason, he departed, he uh, the US Army transport ship Thomas on July 26th with the 31st Infantry Regiment. Thomas uh, was a pretty luxurious ship as far as transport ships go. It could accommodate comfortably 1,300 men, 1,000 horses, and had refrigerated cargo space for 1,000 pounds of meat. Beard and the 31st Infantry, however, were bound for a far less luxurious destination. They were headed for Siberia. Suffering from a myriad of social and economic problems that had been compounded by their involvement in World War I, uh, Russia plunged into chaos in March of 1917 when mass protests against food rationing caused the government to collapse. Uh, soon after that, Tsar Nicholas was forced to abdicate the throne. You can see him here with his family. Um, and he and his family were executed by Bolshevik communist revolutionaries. A uh, provisional government took control that was deeply unpopular. And soon after that, the Bolsheviks gained control of Russia and the revolt turned into a full-scale civil war. Uh, the allied powers fighting in World War I were very alarmed by the situation in Russia and feared that Russia would be unable to continue to commit troops to the war and that radicalism would take over Europe. So they pressed for uh, soldiers from all of the allied countries to also get involved in Russia. 
And the U.S. agreed in 1918 to send soldiers to Siberia to help protect the Trans-Siberian Railway and uh, ensure that supplies could keep moving toward the front in Europe. Uh, according to President Wilson, his goal for sending Americans to Siberia was to study any efforts at self-government or self-defense in which the Russians themselves may be willing to accept assistance, and also to guard the vast amount of military supplies that had built up in and around Vladivostok during the war, which may subsequently be needed by Russian forces in the organization of their own self-defense. So Harold and the 31st Infantry had a big job ahead of them. And he landed in Vladivostok sometime uh, in July. He was one of 7,950 troops who made up the American Expeditionary Force Siberia. And most of these men came from the 27th and 31st Infantry Regiments. There were men from other nations there as well, including France, Britain, Italy, and Japan. From Vladivostok, AAF Siberia troops headed west by train to a series of small garrisons along the Trans-Siberian Railway. These garrisons served as supply depots and provided some protection against raiding parties of Red Army soldiers. And here you can see some photos that uh, Harold took along the way of a 27th Infantry boxcar, men boarding those boxcars, and an American Expeditionary Force hospital car. One of the things that Harold encountered in his journey were armored trains. Both the white and red Russian armies utilized armored trains to move supplies and soldiers across the frozen terrain of Siberia. Um, there were, of these 300 or so trains, there were only 75 that were built as armored trains. All of the rest of them were cobbled together from whatever parts men could find. Um, they were outfitted with a variety of weapons, um, ranging from large naval artillery pieces the whole way down to small Lewis machine guns. Um, the train on your left, with the soldiers standing in front of it, is a personal armored train of white Russian General Ivan Kalmakov. And the other two pictures of a train originally known as Demuritz, it was built for the Russian army. Um, it was captured by the Bolsheviks in January of 1918. By June of 1918, white Russian army soldiers captured it and renamed it Orlik. So these, uh, these armored trains were riding up and down through Siberia, attacking garrisons or repelling attacks from garrisons. In Siberia, Beard tried to capture as much of his journey as he could. He photographed the scenery on train ride through Siberia, and he collected images of the armored trains, as well as uh, uh, images of his fellow soldiers at his garrison. And he wrote on the back of this picture, I was stationed in this small hut with this bunch of fellows. The closest American troops to us were at Tessina, about four miles. This picture was taken at Kishmish, Siberia. And the garrison at Kishmish held about 40 soldiers. As you can imagine, life in Siberia was very, very difficult. Um, troops were plagued by a constant lack of supplies, including food, fuel, and warm clothing. Um, the horses that they had brought with them from the United States struggled to adapt to the freezing temperatures. Um, in Siberia, many people used factory and camels, which you can see up there in the left, um, in place of horses. They were much better suited to the frozen climate. Um, some of their weapons, like water-cooled machine guns, would not even operate in the conditions of Siberia. Uh, Beard photographed his friend, Private Parker. You can see him there holding his weapon. On the back of the photo, he wrote, note the clothes he has on. Gloves and cap made of muskrat hides. His coat is lined in sheepskin. The photo in the lower left shows three men of the 31st Infantry D Company on guard duty at a neighboring garrison. In 1920, citing unstable civil authority and frequent local military interference, President Wilson ordered evacuation of American troops from Siberia. 
Um, in reality, Wilson pulled troops from Siberia when he realized that there was no hope of uh, the counter revolution beating the Bolsheviks and he did not want the United States to be involved in that. Sometime around April of 1920, uh, Harold left Siberia again on the US Army transport Thomas, this time bound for the Philippines. Um, in the Philippines, the Siberian soldiers were honored with a parade and uh, decorations in July. He was authorized to wear a World War I victory medal with a clasp noting his involvement in Siberia. Um, Beard remained in the army until 1922 and afterwards he became a Pennsylvania State Police Officer. The end. Okay. All right, thank you, Jen. And our last panelist is Dodie Robbins from the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania. Okay, here we go. Um, there we are. Okay, so today I'm going to um, talk to you about one of my favorite pieces of equipment at the Railroad Museum, the Lotus Club. Um, I chose this for the theme of travel because it's essentially a full hotel on wheels. Passengers on this car could relax, sleep, and eat all while traveling to their destination. Um, this car is not open to the public on a regular basis, so most people don't get to see the full interior of the car, just some views from the window or from virtual tours on a kiosk or on their phone. It's a QR card, QR code. Um, since we can't walk through the car together in person today, I'm going to give you a photo tour. But first, I'm going to touch very, very briefly on the history of the car. Originally built by the Pullman Company in 1913 as the sleeping car El Quivera, the Lotus Club was redesigned in the 1930s to a combination sleeping, dining, and lounge car. With lower ridership during the Great Depression, railroads were looking to cut costs by eliminating full dining cars. By leasing cars from the Pullman Company that were multifunctional, the railroads offered the same services for fewer people easing their economic burden. After the rebuild, this car was renamed Lotus Club after a famous New York City literary and arts club. The car remained in Pullman service until it was retired in 1967 and then passed on to private owners. And it was finally donated to the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in 1981. And now for our tour. <laughs> so this car um, has eight divided sections in the main portion of the car. And in this image, you can see um, it's a long shot down the aisle of this main section. So during the daytime, the sections were set up for seating. You can see in the upper right image, each section has two bench style seats facing each other. And tables could be set up between the seats when needed as seen in the photo on the lower left. So you can think of this car in terms of a tiny house or an RV where space is a premium and multifunctionality is a requirement and every inch of space is designed for optimum use. At night, the porter would open up and pull down the upper portion of the section where mattresses and bedding were stored, and they would make up the beds and create two sleeping berths, an upper and a lower. And you can see in this picture, um, a section made with made up berths. You can just tell the upper berth in the top corner of the photo. So this next image gives you a little more detail of a made up lower berth with a standard pull-in blanket and a hammock to use for luggage or other items. And in order to get in and out of the upper berth, a porter would bring a step ladder for the guest, which you can see in the front right here. This next image shows a made up upper berth and you can see the call button for the porter in the back here, right behind the uh, luggage hammock which you would call when you needed your ladder. And you can also notice on the side that there are only heavy curtains to use for privacy. Now, the Pullman Company hired porters to provide service to passengers on their cars. The company historically hired predominantly Black men for this position. The porter's job was to assist and accommodate the passengers throughout the duration of the trip. And here I have some photos from our uh, our archives from the Bud Company that portray a porter on the job with passengers in a similar section type car. These are publicity photos, um, but you can see, you know, the porter helping out 
showing women the lower birth, bringing up ladder to another guest and helping somebody else in the back there in the last picture. This car also features a men's room and a women's room located at opposite ends of the seating and sleeping area. The men's room is slightly larger to accommodate more male travelers. Uh, the first image on the left here shows the two main sinks in the middle of the room and uh, the door to the toilet area on the far left. There is a leather bench on the far right of the room and the back of the bench lifts and creates a counter area which is right below a large mirror as seen in the far right image. The middle image is of the bench in its normal sitting position and this bench is also where the porter could rest if it was not otherwise in use. And this photo shows us the women's room, which is slightly smaller. And instead of a bench, there's a little swivel chair. Um, in this image, you can see the chair, the two main sinks, and there's a small dental sink, sink um, a large mirror, and there's a water cooler above the sink in the corner. Now near the middle of the car is a stainless steel kitchen. This first image here shows the right side of the kitchen. Um, where there is a sink, an ice cream freezer, and a toaster. And as you can see, all the stainless steel all kind of like merges together. But in this image here uh, shows the left side of the kitchen, so the opposite side of the room, where there are some refrigerators and some, and some counter space. And you can see the one refrigerator door is open. You see how much space they have. This last image shows the coal burning stove and a warming area of the kitchen. And despite the small size, two to three people could work in that space. So every inch of space in the kitchen is utilized and there are hand and footholds located in strategic places so staff could reach high shelves. In the back of the car is the dining and lounge area. And this picture is taken from the doorway going into that room. And in the front here is the dining area and in the back is your lounge. And currently there are three tables with seating for four people at each table. The image on the left shows one of the tables with bench seating and the right image shows a table with chair seating. Right now the tables are set with a China pattern used by the Pullman company called Indian Tree. And last year we have the lounge area. Um, there are currently there are five armchairs and a love seat which you can see on the image on the left. And in the right is a picture of a chrome ashtray and drink stand. And so you could come and sit in this area and there are large um, windows to give passengers a view of the landscape. So now I would like to show you a short film we put together to give you an idea of what it might be like to travel in the Lotus Globe. Traveling for business? Going on vacation? Why not traveling comfort on the Lotus Club? Roomy seating during the day turns into comfortable sleeping sections during the night, so you can get the rest you need. There are both a women's room and a men's room to tidy up and get ready for dinner or bedtime. Our tiny yet fully equipped kitchen will serve you delicious refreshments and meals. Enjoy a meal or kick back, read the paper, and have a drink in our dining and lounge area. On the Lotus Club, you will arrive at your destination relaxed and refreshed, even after a long day of travel. The end. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, panelists. Normally, this time is uh, for questions and answers, and I am not seeing any questions and answers or any questions. So, uh, with with that said, I guess it's time to to vote. I so, do have one question. Oh. For Dodie. <laughs> Where do they put the tables? Because it doesn't look like they they um, 
are just lifted up on a hinge or something like that. They actually, well, the tables in the dining area are between the little sofas. Between sofa, they actually are on a hinge. There's a hinge on the wall, and then there's a, a table like leg that kind of flips up and down. So you can flip that leg down, unhinge it, and then they just it goes flat and they store it in a closet. Yeah, I didn't see the table there. That's why I was wondering. Yeah. Okay, and um, Bradley Smith started to type a question about the um, the pack saddle from Bushy Run, but didn't complete the, the question. All right, do we know how this simple utilitarian item su survived over 250 years? I, I honestly am unsure how long, how it has lasted that long. I know it was a found item and it, it was in the possession of PHMC and became part of the museum display quite a while ago. Um, it is a uh, basically just a wooden metal frame. It is very utilitarian. I can't imagine being a horse and having to carry that thing on my back because it does not look comfortable in any way. All right, thank you, Sean. Uh, Tracy Smith asks, I'm curious about if there's any Lincoln ties to this railroad car since it is Pullman. Um, not directly, although Abraham Lincoln's son, I can't remember the name, he did work for the Pullman company probably earlier than this car was built, if I'm remembering correctly. So that would be the only tie to Lincoln that I can think of. All right. Thank you. Okay, so I am going to launch the poll now. And you all have a chance to, uh, to vote on who you think best um, covered our topic of travel and destination. I saw there was a question about building the canals in Madison Square Garden. I have no idea how that happened, but I'm sure that they had um, crews of people building that, that worked there at Madison Square Gardens, just like any other big um, drama kind of thing. Like some people are still voting. Hey, David, I saw there was one more question about the horse packs. Okay. Um, that was basically, uh, that was the frame style that they used in the period. So any horse that wasn't pulling a carriage and was carrying supplies was basically carrying that. So to know exactly how many it would be, I would be unable to answer, but um, it was a pretty standard item for that time period. All right, we've had 25 of 29 people vote. So if you would like to vote, please, uh, please do so. Okay, we have another question uh, for um, Jennifer. Does Harold's unit still exist in today's army? You know, that's a good question. I am not sure off the top of my head if the 31st Infantry Regiment still exists or not. And I'll I try would, to find out. <laughs> I would really like to encourage people to vote because it looks like we have a tie for first place. We still have four people that are eligible to vote. Jennifer, a quick look says that the 31st was uh, dissolved in 1968. Yes, I just found the same thing. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. And we did have uh, another person vote, which actually 
we have a distinct winner. And uh, our winner this evening is Jennifer Gleim from the Military History Museum. So congratulations, Jennifer. You'll get a chance to host one of our museum showcases in the, in the future. All right, so I'd like to thank all the panelists for participating in tonight's program. I hope everybody had a good time and learned something. And I believe we all hope that you will consider traveling to one of our PHMC sites along the Pennsylvania Trail of History sometime soon. So with that said, I wish everybody a wonderful evening and thanks for attending.